Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the October 15th Standing Committee on Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management. Councillor DeRuz has indicated he will not be here today, so we just didn't put his name plate out. As you can see, it's like he's just dead to us. So, <laughs> declarations of interest, seeing none. Confirmation of minutes for the meeting of Tuesday, December, September, sorry, 17th, 2019. Is that carried? I presume Mr. Zuprowski got it right. Yeah, carried, has anyone say? Okay, good, thanks, I was waiting with bated breath. Uh, communications, response to inquiries, rats. All right then, on to the, the agenda. Let me just see, we have a very busy agenda today. There's one plus the, no, so there's one item on the agenda. Um, it is the Robert O. Picard Environmental Center Electrical Reliability and Efficient Use of Digester Gas Project. Um, that is the item. There is also um, information previously distributed. I think we're going to have a presentation on that. So Councilor Menard, I believe, has a motion to add the tree canopy assessment to the agenda. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Um, so that pursuant to subsection 89.3 of the procedure bylaw, the Standing Committee of Environmental Protection, Water and Waste Management approved the rules of procedure be waived uh, to allow for the consideration of the item tree canopy assessment, Canada's capital region. On adding the item? Okay, thank you. So we have the two items now, which is better than one. And we will go right to our first item. So I'm gonna ask staff to come up and provide a presentation. Thank you all, if you won't mind, Kevin, introducing your Certainly. Your team of exceptional staff here. <laughs> to my left is Todd Piper. He's going to be working the slides for us. To his left is Tyler Hicks. He is our plant manager for the Pickard Center. And to his left is um, Heather Freeman, and she is the director of our TIES group, which is our technology, innovation, and engineering group. So good morning, Chair and members of committee. We're very excited to present to you today a project that's been several years in the making. Not only does this project provide significant financial and environmental benefits that will be discussed momentarily, but it also aligns very well with Council's environmental priorities, including the declaration of a climate emergency in the city, or city earlier this year. To me, this project, the benefits of this project include our air, our river, and our tax dollars. And I'm now going to turn things over to Tyler. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you, Chair and members of the committee for having us here today. Before we jump into the details of why you're here, I wanted to take a moment to explain the city's wastewater system as a whole. The collection and treatment of wastewater is a critical service for the city of Ottawa. The city's wastewater collection system covers almost 3,000 square kilometers between Orleans, Stittsville, and Manatick. The system includes 2,853 kilometers of sanitary sewers and over 60 wastewater pumping stations. There are approximately 230,000 service connections to the system. Through these pipes and pumping stations, all of the sewage collected in the city makes its way to the Robert O. Picard Environmental Center, more commonly known as ROPAC. This is the photo you see on your screen. Originally built in 1962, ROPAC has undergone a number of upgrades and expansions and now has an asset value of over $1.7 billion. On average, ROPEC treats 415 million liters of wastewater every day, which can increase by almost a billion liters during wet weather events. The robust treatment process ensures the effluent meets or exceeds the criteria established by the Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks and Environment Canada, as well as that chemicals tr from the treatment process do not adversely affect the natural water source. Through the sewage treatment process at ROPEC, organic material is removed. These solids are digested anaerobically, producing biosolids and a biogas, which is referred to as digester gas. Both products of digestion have benefits. The biosolids are used to replace organic fertilizer, or agricultural, for 
uh, replace fertilizer for agricultural use, and digester gas can be used as a renewable energy source. In 1996, staff introduced the possibility to use digester gas at ROPEC as a way to save energy costs and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This was made possible through what is referred to as cogeneration. Since coming online in 1997, cogeneration at ROPEC has saved the city between $1 and $1.5 million annually, with last year's savings estimated at $1.4 million. The use of methane as a fuel for the cogeneration engines has also provided the city environmental benefits through a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions at the plant. Last year, this equated a reduction of approximately 500 tons of CO2 equivalent in the year. After 22 years of continuous operation, the cogeneration units are at the end of their service life and need to be replaced. As can be seen starting in the left-hand side of the slide, digester gas can be utilized in one of two ways, as a fuel source for one of the plant's on-site boiler systems as indicated in the top, or as a fuel source for the three existing cogeneration engines as indicated on the bottom. Moving to the right, you'll notice that both of these operating approaches generates heat, which is captured and used in the plant. In addition to heat production, when digester gas is utilized in the cogeneration units, these units produce electricity up to a maximum of 2,430 kilowatts, which is used on site, therefore reducing the amount of electricity purchased from the grid. Due to the current distribution system configuration, these engines are only capable of providing power to approximately 40% of the plant. When digester gas is directed towards the boiler system, it serves as an alternative fuel source to imported natural gas, and therefore provides the dual benefit of lower natural gas costs and reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Currently, due to the design of the distribution system, digester gas can only be utilized in one of two on-site boiler systems. At certain times of the year, there is no available use for digester gas, and on average, 30% of this valuable resource is wasted. While the project was initially born out of a need to replace the aging cogeneration engines, there are a number of other system restrictions, risks, and vulnerabilities that we are looking to address. For example, the plant's electrical distribution system is configured in such a way that power produced through cogen can only be fed to one side of the plant. As a result, there's insufficient capacity to make use of all the gas produced on site. This provides an opportunity to modify the electrical distribution system to permit power produced by cogen to be used throughout the plant and not waste this renewable energy source. A similar restriction exists on the heating system. Heat produced by cogen can only be fed to one side of the plant's heating loop. This provides the opportunity to modify the heating loop to permit heat produced from digester gas to be used throughout the plant. There is one high voltage power feed to the plant from Hydro Ottawa's Hawthorne Station. An interruption in this power supply will result in a plant outage. Three on-site diesel generators are available to supply backup power to critical areas of the plant, but cannot provide sufficient power to all treatment processes. In the event of a sustained failure greater than 12 hours, Sewage will bypass treatment and be discharged to the river, requiring reporting to the MECP, public health and downstream users. In an, area of, in an era of greater climate impacts, tornadoes and other events, this is becoming a considerable risk. The current cogeneration engines can only operate in parallel with the utility and cannot operate in the event of a utility failure. This provides an opportunity to combine cogen power with the on-site diesel generators to permit the plant to run in isolation from the grid using on-site generated power only, or islanding, providing a significant improvement in resiliency. Finally, some of the other critical components of the distribution system, including transformers and load control centers, are nearing the end of their life. A failure of one of these components would have a similar effect as a utility outage. Not only are we looking to replace the cogens with this project, but we are also looking to address these existing system vulnerabilities to make the plant more reliable and robust. With the units operating 24-7 and nearing the end of their service life, staff began working with Envari, formerly Energy Ottawa, the city's preferred partner in energy management initiatives, together with other industry partners starting in 2015, to begin reviewing options for the efficient use of digester gas at ROPEC. The work completed to date has been extensive, including a preliminary and detailed engineering study to assess the cogeneration system, an essential power study to look at existing and peak loading on the essential power system, including an evaluation of capacity and redundancy within the generation and distribution systems, a draft electrical master plan to address life cycle replacements, levels of risk associated with aged equipment, capacity, growth, and service level expectations. All of these studies and plans work to inform the development of a comprehensive business case, which was recently completed and approved in 2019. 
The business case examined a total of five options and included an extensive analysis of operating and capital cost and utilities modeling for each option. To further supplement the financial and utilities information, the project team also adopted five project objectives to guide the evaluation process and identify the recommended option. This slide lays out the five options evaluated by the project team, as well as the list of adopted project objectives. The options evaluated were option one, status quo, which would consist of maintaining the existing cogeneration units and conducting repairs and component replacement as required. Option two was electrical rehabilitation only, where the end of life electrical equipment would be upgraded, but the city would get out of the cogeneration business. The cogen units would no longer be maintained and eventually fail, likely after one or two years. Options three, four, and five are similar, but with different number or size of cogen units. Option three includes the installation of three new cogen units with a generation capacity of 810 or 1,000 kilowatts each. Option four includes the installation of four new cogen units, each with uh, 1,000 kilowatts each. And option five includes the installation of five new cogen units with a generation capacity of 1,000 kilowatts each. These three options also include modifications to the electrical distribution and heating loop systems to better leverage the electrical and thermal benefits, and modifications to the incoming electrical feed so that the plant is able to operate independently of the grid during a power outage. All of the options evaluated also include the replacement of end-of-life electrical equipment to improve system reliability. On the right-hand side of the slide is the list of five project objectives adopted, adopted and used to evaluate the options in addition to the financial analysis. Notably, these objectives include climate and system resiliency, de decreasing the plant's vulnerability to environmental spills and supporting plant operation independent of the utility grid, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in alignment with the city's GHG emission reduction targets, and operational flexibility. Recognizing that there are unknowns in utility market rates and structures, government programs and funding, we are looking for options to provide the greatest ability to generate utility savings or revenue and reduce GHGs. In the preferred option, we're looking to have an approach that is flexible and adaptive, including adaptive to a potential other future use of digester gas, if so decided. It is worth noting that a preliminary review by staff also considered other options, such as renewable natural gas and the use of diesel generators in place of cogeneration units. However, these options were either deferred for further examination, as is the case for RNG, or eliminated due to notable limitations in achieving the project objectives. The results of the business case analysis supports the option to proceed with four new 1,000 kilowatt cogeneration units, as well as the corresponding upgrades to end-of-life electrical equipment and modifications to the electrical distribution and heating loop systems, and the improvements to the incoming electrical feed. This recommendation had the lowest net present value cost over the 25-year financial analysis and was the best able to meet the project objectives. This option provides the city with a number of benefits, including estimated utility savings of approximately 80 million over 25 years, GHG avoidance of 1,565 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year compared with status quo. This is roughly equivalent to removing two years worth of GHG emitted from City Hall on an annual basis. It is also worth noting that 80% of these GHG reductions is due to a reduction of natural gas usage. This option also provides sufficient processing capacity to utilize all available digester gas until at least 2027, improved electrical system reliability, the ability to provide full wastewater treatment during a power outage through the use of cogen and diesel engines, and the flexibility to cater to future alternative uses of biogas. The benefit of flexibility concerning future biogas utilization is particularly important in light of the upcoming biogas optimization study that will be completed in Q4 2020. This study is an action item from phase one of energy evolution and will investigate additional technologies for utilization of digester gas, including renewable natural gas. Should this study identify recommended alternate uses for biogas in the future, the city would be able to realize 85% of the anticipated utility savings while using only about 10% of the available digester gas, leaving 90% of the total available gas to be used for an alternative purpose. This would be achieved by using the cogen units during peak periods only to offset the plant's global adjustment charges. Proceeding with this option provides climate resiliency and ensures continuous treatment, permits greater and more beneficial use of gas, both in terms of financial and environmental savings, 
and provides the greatest operational flexibility to react to changing energy markets in the future. It is because of these numerous benefits and the ability to meet all of the project objectives that staff recommend proceeding with this option. The total estimated cost of the recommended option will be up to $57.2 million for design and construction, inclusive of all project management fees and contingencies. It is proposed that the project be funded with $15.4 million from pre-approved capital funding identified in the long-range financial plan, with the remainder of the funding representing up to $41.8 million being funded from the wastewater reserves. Based on the total project cost and estimated utility savings, the simple payback period is estimated to be 14 years. This slide represents the project timelines. While, um, the conceptual design phase was initiated towards the end of 2018. A value engineering session was also completed towards the end of May 2019 with a number of independent industry experts who reviewed the conceptual design with a lens of risk mitigation, value for money, and design suitability. The results of the value engineering session ultimately supports the conceptual design behind the recommended option and made several recommendations which will be considered during the detailed design phase. Once approved by council, staff will ask Invari to begin working on the detailed design phase with the goal of tendering and awarding in Q4 2020 with construction beginning early in 2021 in order to achieve startup and commissioning at the end of 2024. As Kevin mentioned at the start of this presentation, with the environmental benefits of saving more than 1,500 tons of GHG emissions, financial savings of 80 million over the next 25 years, and the provision of significant climate resiliency for the plant, this project and investing in cogeneration infrastructure at ROPEC will serve to create many benefits for our air, our river, and our residents. This concludes our presentation, and we would welcome any questions from members of committee at this time. Thank you very much. Todd, I really appreciate all the words you had today. That's good. Um, <laughs> we'll go straight to questions, so uh, Councillor Eglai. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so you started and ended your presentation with air river dollars. So often at the city we make decisions about dollars before anything else. Um, if we take dollars out of the equation, the cost of implementation, would this have still been your first choice? Yes, this would be the, the best choice for the air as well as cost. So it's, we're, not, we're not putting more emphasis on the dollars as opposed to the positive environmental impacts? No, we are not. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, the, the second part is about the funding. So you're, you're going to take a significant amount of money out of the wastewater reserves to, to, to fund the project. Based on our need or to tap into that reserve over the last number of years, are you, are you comfortable that you're leaving enough of a cushion in the reserve? Because that's a significant chunk you're taking out. Are you comfortable that there's enough of a cushion left in there should something, something go wrong and we're going to have to tap into that reserve? Uh, Chair, the, uh, after this project, it leaves about $30 million in the reserve, which of course grows year over year as part, as part of our long range financial plan. And our asset plan matches that, that funding as well, so we are confident. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Eckler. Councillor Brockington. What is the purpose of a wastewater reserve account? Chair, to renew the asset. The, as Tyler said, it's a $1.7 billion asset that's uh, closing in on 25 years old and uh, requires renewal. So uh, what is the optimal amount to have in that account then? We have aged infrastructure in the city. Chair, as I previously responded to Councillor Eglai, uh, we're confident when you marry our long range financial plan and the growth there, the balance we have now, and the asset management plan, that's the, the look forward for the assets at ROPEC, we're confident that we're, uh, we're covered. Um, in the staff report on page 20, um, they indicate that this project may have been eligible for funding under some of the FCM programs. The grant would be contingent on borrowing money through FCM resulting in interest costs offsetting a large portion of the grant amount. But it still indicates that 
grants would be more than interest payments. So if we would have a net benefit to us financially, why would you still not apply for an FCM grant in this case? Um, we did actually uh, engage with a program called Money for Municipalities, which is a partnership between the Canadian Network of Asset Managers and Funding Portal, who looks for, helps assist municipalities in looking for external grant um, opportunities. So we did engage with them to look at funding opportunities for this project. Unfortunately, nothing uh, came up through that avenue, but we will, we do have design for another year next year, and we'll continue to look for and uh, take advantage of any funding opportunities available. But is that the FCM program you reference in your report or is that something separate? That would be one of them, yes. Okay, so just so I'm clear, are we eligible for an FCM grant or not? It is possible that we would be eligible, um, but we'll have to look at the costs of that to make sure it's feasible. Yeah, I, I have trouble taking $42 million out of reserves and leaving 30 million because I don't think it's sufficient. And especially when there are potential grants out there, that should have all been you know, explored and checked off either yes or no before we start going to a reserve account, which should be a last resort, not a first option. So I don't know if you have anything else, Mr. General Manager, but. Chair, I would just rest uh, assured that, uh, that we will be looking at every opportunity and we did evaluate these opportunities as well as, as Heather pointed out, they weren't feasible at the time. But we're being asked now to approve this. And it's like the report says, staff will continue to review funding opportunities as they arise to make applications where appropriate. I don't know if you can do that retroactively my concern is not that the program isn't good or bad. It's, it's a good program. I want to see this go forward, but it's expensive, and I think we need to exhaust every potential funding opportunity possible before we go into grants or tax dollars. That's my concern that I'm raising today. Yeah, Chair, and we will do that. We'll continue. As Heather said, we're another year in design, so we've got opportunities going forward. As she also said, we're leveraging uh, the organization to look for all grants available uh, to us. Thank you. I think to just add to Mr. Wiley's points about the grants and whatnot, and it's also important to realize that I think you notice this a lot with uh, some of our municipal funding grants, whether it's recreation projects or whatever, that there's a timestamp to those grants that they have. the project has to be completed by a certain date. Most of the grants that we've seen to date do not align with the project timeline for our project. So you could advance it, maybe take some stuff out, shrink it down, do a more simple project to get the grant, but is that really in the best long-term interest of the city? I think the other part too on the reserve aspect is if you look at the original project back in 1997, they also took from reserve $4.5 million from reserve that they put back into reserve in the end because within five years the project made the money back. That's the intent here as well. Whatever gets taken out gets put back in over, I think it's 14 years. So 14 years, next 14 years, the reserve will go up gradually anyways, as Mr. Wiley mentioned with the long range financial plan, but then also this project pays back to the city through savings that then goes back into that reserve account as well. So in essence, there'll be far more in the reserve account 14 years from now than there is today. Councillor Brockington. I think you met me. For some reason I said Councillor Brockington twice, but clearly he already spoke. What I meant was Councillor Menard. Usually I'm used to Councillor Brockington over here. It's just set me up for a loop. Also, they're both tall and I'm not. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Chair. Um, so overall, this is great news and good job on, on the work here. Uh, I had a number of questions last year uh, when we were looking at the budget items around this and I think you, you, through our meeting, I think you've alleviated a lot of those concerns. So the savings of $80 million over the 25 year life cycle, that's, that's a fantastic thing. Um, it's critical we, we look at those opportunities in the city where we lower GHGs and we have savings associated with them. I think there's a number of areas we're, we're talking about now. This is, this is certainly one of them. Uh, to Councillor Eglai's question, um, there is going to be, though, a, a biogas optimi optimization study that we're looking at that comes back in, is it Q4 2020? So we'll know then if there's a, uh, some other optimization we can use with these, these faci this facility and some of the, the, uh, how we generate um, energy. 
and whether that makes sense to just continue on with this or if there's a, a renewable natural gas component that comes into it as well, which could lower GHGs or uh, be a higher uh, savings for it as well. So I'll look forward to that, that study. Um, and my understanding too is we have future capacity with this as well. So that uh, as the population of Ottawa grows, um, the fact that we're buying four uh, rather than, than three or, or five, it, this is an optimal use. We could add another <clears throat> in the future. So I have a fifth um, cogeneration uh, um, unit. So that, that's a good uh, piece of information as well. I have a couple of questions. Um, we're working with Invari regarding the construction of the project. Can you just give me more information about that? I know we worked with them initially on this, but it says we're working with them on the on the construction of, of the project. Is this separate to the city that, that they're doing this, or is this internal to the city? If you could just explain a little bit more to me so I understand fully how Invari factors into the construction of the project. And Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, so we would be contracting in Bari, and they would be the project managers and essentially design builders. So we would have a contract with Invari as one entity, and then the procurement and tendering for uh, the contract and the construction would be through them. Okay, so they're, they would do the procurement tendering portion of it, uh, the rest of it. There's no loan there. The funds are coming specifically through, through our, our means. Okay. That's correct. Okay, um, just with regard to Councillor Brockington's question and, and Councillor and the Chair's uh, remarks, I think it is important that we do look for opportunities wherever possible. Um, you know, I, I've worked with FCM before and, and I, in the business that I owned previously, I got grants for digester gas storage in different municipalities, but what they were usually for is for storage, uh, for uh, the study. Okay, so they'll look at the study in, in that case, and so there were smaller grants, but they were, they were fully paid for by FCM. Um, but it was just the study portion of it. On the capital expenditure of these sorts of things, there's less, there's less available there, and usually the interest rates you're getting on those, is a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a loan in addition to a grant, but the interest rate is normally higher than what we could borrow at under those rates. So in this case, I, I read the report, I understand which way you're, which way you're headed with it, uh, although I do think the federal election is going on right now, there could be some changes that come there, so I do, I do want to make sure to Councillor Brockington's point that we can come back and, and look at other options that might be available. There's a lot of new money flowing into FCM, for example, for these types of uh, projects in the future. So um, I just want to make sure we can, we can go back, that we're not uh, solidifying this today to say we can't, we can't go back and look uh, later on for the construction period of 2024, I guess it is, right? So is that the case? Do, is that your understanding too, that we could, even if we approve this today, we could go back and, and still apply for other grants? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Menard. Councillor Cloutier. Thank you, Chair. Merci beaucoup pour votre présentation. Just touching on a little bit of what Councillor Eglai Brockington and Menard have, have touched on. Uh, first of all, the, the payback is, is, is great. It's a project that benefits uh, the environment and, uh, and, and it has to be done, um, given the age of, the, of ROPEC. Um, th we're, we're taking 41.8 million from wastewater reserve, let me ask the question this way. Are there any um, projects that had been contemplated by the department with respect to all the assets, wastewater assets and water treatment assets in the city that we won't be able to do? What's the opportunity cost of this project that won't be able to do because we are investing or not taking advantage of grants in, into, into this project? in a five-year horizon, let's say. Sorry, Chair, I just confirmed with Mr. Hicks that no, we're not pushing any, any projects off, any critical projects or, or otherwise because of this project. So when we look at our comprehensive asset management plan and assets that will need work, or might benefit from new technology that might be on the horizon, we are not displacing any of those because we're doing this as, as wonderful as this project is. Sure, that's correct. And I should say, we've over the years, we've been doing quite a bit of renewal at that plant. As you can appreciate, at 25 years old, things are starting to require a renewal. So that's been an ongoing process. 
my question does relate not only to ROPEC, but to all the assets of the city that this department is responsible for. Chair, that specific uh, reserve fund is just for ROPEC and uh, wastewater collection systems. Okay, thank you. Um, in the opportunity cost uh, sphere, are there any risks, uh, regulatory changes uh, on the electrical distribution horizon or environmental horizon that that would render this uh, this investment um, less profitable, less uh, less value for our taxpayers? Uh, Chair. Um as we mentioned, one of the ways we evaluated this project was really about operational flexibility going into the future. Um, the electrical market will definitely change in the next 25 years, and the option we have selected will be able to adapt to that. One of the key factors in our current electrical uh, billing structure is the peak management. Um, as far as I understand from, from industry experts, that is expected to continue and is done throughout um, throughout North America and as well as throughout uh, the Western world because peak management is one of the most critical ways that utilities have to lower energy costs and capital uh, expenditures on their end. So we do expect things to change and we do expect that this project will allow us to be flexible to those changes as well as the potential for natural gas rates to increase quite significantly and that being more of a cost effective offset than hydro. As my last question, Chair, thank you. The, um, as, um, as we contemplate the amount of electricity that this will generate, uh, we, we do not expect it to, the cogeneration to ever fulfill all the electrical needs of the plant in, 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 this, uh, in your planning horizon. With the, um, with the organics from sewage, no. However, we will look for other streams and other feedstock to the digesters, which will increase gas production and potentially allow us to run without importing hydro. And in, in the current technology, in, in what we are contemplating, would, would that permit us to feed, to sell electricity to the grid? Yeah, we haven't looked into that detail yet as to whether, uh, the t nothing we're doing right now would preclude us from doing that in the future. Thanks. Thanks. There is a grid capacity issue, though, at the, in the province of Ontario. There's actually too much power. Uh, using this fully within, fully within the site is actually quite, uh, quite positive. And I know you mentioned feedstocks. There is a potential for our solid waste master plan to fit in to what we do here at ROPEC as well in the future in terms of a, a post-order world reality. Councillor McKenney? You know, my questions were around Envari and were answered. Okay. Uh, Great. Eric, Councillor King. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I know that I had a recent uh, uh, presentation on this project and was really excited, especially around uh, climate uh, resiliency, because I think that's very important to ensure that the, the plant is operating, uh, whether or not uh, we have issues with the electrical grid. I think that's really important to ensure that we're not dumping a, a tremendous amount of waste in, uh, in the river, especially since we know that uh, we are going to continue to be challenged by 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 climate change. Uh, my question builds on uh, Councillor Cloutier's uh, uh, line of cr uh, questioning. I'm just wondering whether we have a specific target uh, for the wastewater reserve, noting that uh, the facility is a $1.7 billion uh, facility. I mean, that could amount in a tremendous amount of uh, need for further capital investment. And I'm just wondering, uh, are there specific uh, amounts that uh, you target for that reserve? Minimum. Chair, just ask Francois Lurie to come up. He's uh, manager, account manager of our financial unit. Uh, Mr. Chair, the current city policy on the reserve funds doesn't have specific targets for the uh, rate supported reserve funds. But what we can say is that the reserve funds that we've projected fit within the long range financial plan and uh, the asset management plan uh, for the city's assets. Thank you very much. Any other questions for staff? No? 
thing. Well, thank you for the, for the presentation. Appreciate you being here today. So I appreciate the, the positive uh, support from members of committee as well. That is, you know, this is a, a good project. It certainly deviates from what we had originally planned, but I think it, it's a step in the right direction and it puts us on better footing. You know, obviously we saw what happened uh, last September. If that happened in the East End, it would be quite impactful to this plant. So being able to run the plants in a major power edge like that is incredibly important for our entire city. Thank you. So just get back to the committee. So on the item, so number one, approve the upgrades to the Robert O. Picard Environmental Center as described in this report. Two, approve an increase in capital expenditure authority for project 906648 digester gas utilization of $41.8 million for a total of $57.2 million and that the increase be funded from the wastewater reserve and three, Delegate the authority to the general manager of public works and environmental services in consultation with the city solicitor to negotiate, finalize, and execute a contract with Envari Energy Solutions Incorporated in accordance with this report. Is that item carried? Carried, sir. Carried. Thank you very much. So we will move on to the second item of the agenda, which is the tree canopy assessment item. We'll invite Martha Cope to take up here for a presentation for us. This is a good precursor to uh, in a couple months we'll have the climate change master plan here so it's good to have this as a bit of a precursor to that report in a couple months. Okay, here we go, just getting organized. <clears throat> okay, as Chair Moffat said, I'm Martha Kopstick. I'm a forester in the Natural Systems and Rural Affairs Group of PIDE, and I'm here to give you just a short presentation on the tree canopy assessment, or tree, cano tree canopy assessment for Canada's capital region. So this was a joint project that we did um, between the City of Ottawa, the NCC, and the City of Gatineau. Um, we actually just held about a couple of weeks ago an event to release the report at the end of September in celebration of National Tree Day. So it's an important project because it provides us with a baseline canopy cover data which we didn't have before and which we can use for future analysis of the urban forest as well as some key follow-up work that's recommended from our uh, urban forest management plan which I'll talk a little bit about at the end of the presentation. So one of the 26 recommendations of the city's urban forest management plan was to undertake a comprehensive urban forest canopy cover study in order to develop canopy cover targets and to assist in the prioritization of our tree planting efforts. So this report that, that you've, you've got in front of you now represents sort of the first phase of that study. So as I said before, it gives us baseline data for the region's tree canopy cover. Tree canopy is basically defined as the layer of tree leaves, branches, and stems that provide tree coverage on the ground when viewed from above. So the tree canopy assessment consisted of a mapping and technical analysis of the canopy cover across the full cities of Ottawa and Gatineau and the NCC lands. So remote sensing data, including aerial imagery and LIDAR, form the foundational information for doing the canopy cover mapping. And then we, GIS was used to analyze the data on a variety of scales including partner ownership, so the three different partners, and for Ottawa by neighborhood and ward. The study found that overall, the canopy cover for the whole region is 46%, which is quite high as we, we can imagine, and that for the full city of Ottawa, it's 38%. So that's including the urban and the rural lands. So it's important to consider how this data can be skewed by areas of high concentration of trees, for instance, the rural area or the green belt in, in Ottawa's case. And as a result, reporting on such a large scale area like the full city, including the rural area, or even the full urban area, doesn't really adequately show the tree canopy realities for most neighborhoods. 
So that's why we also wanted to report this data by ward and by neighborhood. And, and when, as we're moving through our analysis, we'll be using it by ward and by neighborhood more so than that full city um, uh, data. So the urban area, the, for the full urban area, the percentage was 31% canopy cover. Um, so this includes the lands inside the Greenbelt and our suburbs outside the Greenbelt, but also the Greenbelt itself. So if you look at the figure here, oh, it's pretty small, but um, it lists all the wards in the region, so for Ottawa and Gatineau. Um, the pink or purpley wards are the Ottawa wards. And you can see that within the urban area, the ward canopy coverage is ranged from a low of 22% in Somerset Ward up to a high of 48% in College Ward. So the data showed also that there's statistically significant relationship between medium income and tree canopy cover. And so it's not true in every situation, but generally if you look at the Statistics Canada's dissemination areas, as median income increases, tree canopy cover does as well. So probably the most exciting stuff to talk about as a part of this project is what we're going to do next. So the first thing we're going to do now that we have this data is to look at it in conjunction with our land cover mapping data to determine how much plantable space there is in the city and where that space is. And from there, we're going to be able to determine appropriate canopy cover targets for Ottawa. In developing these new targets, we're also going to be looking closely at recent research on canopy cover and what levels provide the greatest benefits. And we're also going to work on developing a tree planting prioritization tool. So by assessing our existing canopy, the space that we have available to plant and our new targets, we're going to apply criteria to determine where we should be focusing our tree planting efforts across the city. So we, we still have to determine, go through this process and determine the criteria, but the kinds of things that we will be considering are things like urban heat island mitigation, equitable access to the benefits of trees in the urban forest, energy savings, the presence of vulnerable populations, carbon sequestration and carbon storage, and other public health considerations. And finally, of course, we'll aim to reassess Ottawa's tree canopy about every five years or so. So this is going to let us be able, make us be able to better monitor our urban forest cover, which we haven't been able to do in the past because we didn't have this baseline data, and then and make changes and revise policies as necessary to protect our valuable asset. So in summary, the tree canopy assessment shows that Ottawa has a solid foundation to grow its urban forest, despite some of the challenges that it has been facing. That's it. So thanks so much for having us here to talk about this. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. It's quite interesting. I, I wondered the, um, will for certain wards, like I think of Barhaven Alta Vista in particular, Barhaven because obviously it's, a, it's one of the bottom ones, but it's an incredibly rapid growth area with new plantings, and then Alta Vista, given the predominance of Emerald Ash Borer that affected that ward, likely why it's so low. With those two wards, will we look at a, like a projection as to where it will be, where it can be, based on the plantings and whatnot, how that will achieve in the future? Because I imagine both those wards would be scaling upwards based on from where, they're, where they are today to where they could be. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think that that will come out as we do our available spaces thing and we're talking, looking at the planting prioritization because we will see that the, there are plantings that have occurred there, you know, yeah. so that will come out for sure. Because yeah. certainly you look at some of the wards and obviously Somerset Ward, is, it's, it's hamstrung a little bit in its potential for a tree canopy. But um, but interesting too, the college ward is so high. So as you might know, I, I'm the counselor for college wards. People don't often realize that, but uh, Two of my wards that I represent are in the top four, so I'm pretty proud of that. <laughs> I imagine that Cal's ward became number one after I represented it, but I'm not, I shouldn't take credit for that. Councilor Aguilar? Not sure how to follow that. Um, so uh, obviously my ward got hit very hard by the tornado and we lost many, many trees. So is this baseline pre or post tornado? It's it is pre-tornado, so this is the, the um, aerial photographs that we use to, to do this, this, this analysis were from 2017. So it was about, it was late summer 2017. So, so do you have any sense then, I think I'm at 25%, do you have any sense of what the real, what the real number is? We haven't looked into that as of yet. 
okay. Um, are, are we going to, or are we, I mean, for it to be an effective baseline, and again, I, I, can't, I can't speak for uh, Councilor El, El Shantiri, but I'm assuming his word also took, his numbers will be skewed quite, mm -hmm. quite a bit as well as a result of the, of the tornado. So I'm just, if we're using this to make decisions about plantings and where resources go and that sort of thing, I think both of those words are probably, that's, that's not reflective of the true circumstances. Yeah, uh, as we start looking in depth at like a ward and a neighborhood level in terms of the planting prioritization, that kind of stuff will come out easily because we'll be, we, we're aware of what has happened in those wards and that kind of thing, so it will come out of it. And um, it's, I can bring it back to my colleagues to discuss if there's another way that we can represent it and, and we can think yeah, about just, that. I mean, just so long as that's factored in because, you know, if you have bad data, I'm not saying it was bad at the time, but it's, it's clearly bad today. Right, um, just uh, you know the tree devastation in Bruce Pitt, for example, and and all the trees that went there. Um, so I just want to make sure that as we go forward and we look at a strategy for how we're going to plant in the city and where we're going to plant in the city, that it's taken into account. Again, I can't speak for Cal Council Shantiri, but I'm assuming he's in a similar space. Um, that that's taken into account, even though the number says 25. We know in reality it's really not really not 25. Yeah, it absolutely will be taken okay, into account. Okay, thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. Thank you very much. Councillor Brockington. Um, thank you. Um, one option would be to put a note on this graph and just say exactly the date that this was acquired. It does not factor into any of the major weather events that's happened. Certainly, Councillor Eglise Ward took a direct hit, but there were four wards. I know at the city we forget about River Ward and Gloucester Southgate. Those were the two other wards that were hit by the tornado, and we certainly lost our fair share of trees. Um, it's a start. There is This is a benchmark, and I appreciate the um, effort to at least put this before us and appreciate the comment that your plan is to refresh this every five years, so I think that's very good. My only concern is that, um, and I, I, you know, I want to openly share this, but residents will look at this, they'll see their ward at the bottom, they'll go, oh, there'll be an expectation that we are going to put significant resources into these wards. And so I think you need to better explain your strategy for the wards, how you're going to use this data to guide your strategy for tree planting. Some wards may deserve or need trees more than others because of many factors that have gone into that. But River Ward is, you know, in the bottom third. I've always interpreted my ward to be fairly green. Uh, I look at the experimental farm, which does not have a lot of trees per se, but a study's just come out that said has basically pure air over the farm. There was a study that came about it two weeks ago. So. Um, we don't have to plant the entire farm full of trees in order to have significant environmental benefit, but certainly I'm not arguing against trees. So help me understand my residency, River Ward, bottom third. How do I explain to them what the, the steps are next? What's going to happen next specifically? And that, that's germane to really any, any ward. How are you going to take this data specifically for a particular ward? How yeah. do you move forward? So that's the next step for us to do. So as I said in the presentation, it's, it's covered on this slide here. These are the kinds of criteria that we're going to be looking at to, to develop our tree planting prioritization tool. So um, various public health type considerations, such as urban heat island, but also things like equitable access to tree, trees and urban forest benefits. So that's our next step. So, you know, at this point, we've got this sort of high-level summary of how we're going to be looking at it, and um, our next step is to take this data and uh, and and develop that tree planting prioritization tool. So, are you able to correlate that words at the bottom, absolutely with confidence, are short in these criteria? Because I don't believe that. I believe that there could be other factors that contribute to a lower score. 
Yeah, absolutely, and that's what we're, that's basically as we look at the, the um, our land cover data and, and basically develop a picture for each of these wards or neighborhoods, and I see myself talking on more of a neighborhood type level on this because that's how we roll out our, our tree maintenance and our tree planting programs and stuff, so it'll be on a smaller scale, but as we look at um, the land cover data and we understand what available space there is for tree planting and develop our canopy cover targets based on that, we're going to be paint, painting a, a better picture of what's going on and from there we do the tree planting prioritization thing so we have a few steps to go before we're going to get there and we're working we're working on it so how much wiggle room will there be for members of the public who contact their counselors want a tree for their front lawn want it for the local park want it to help beautify the neighborhood doesn't necessarily meet your list of criteria so how much wiggle room or flexibility will there be to continue to plant trees and wards based on public demand? Well, we still, we haven't made any stipulations about canceling any of our tree plantings or anything like a tree planting programs or anything. So like our um, Trees and Trust program, which is the program I think that you're talking about, that people can get in touch with the city to ask for trees to be planted. There's no, we plan for that to continue just as it is now. So all, all of this is still to be determined. This is our baseline data and these are our, our plans moving forward and, and we still need to determine them all. But there's no, no reason for us to believe that we would not be still taking requests for tree planting as we go along. Good. Uh, the only point I wanted to emphasize is I want those two to work in lockstep, the public demand or request plus the criteria you're developing. I think the criteria are, are solid, but we cannot um, discount or ignore these public requests that haven't factored or gone through this criteria. They're still valid. I think the requests, we're, we're having trouble keeping up with requests, and I just wanted to better understand how in the future we're going to mesh those two components. Can I make just one quick point following up on that? Uh, one of the things for us is that the, the best place to plant a tree is a place where the people who live there want the tree, you know? So that's, that works in our favor all the time. Thank you, Councillor Menard. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, thank you for the report and, and the work on this. It's great. Um, I have a question about the when the tree planting prioritization tool may become available. Um, so you mentioned the, the criteria that, that you're looking, potentially looking at, which is great. Um, but when can we expect some of those next steps to occur? Uh, in, a, in a year's time or how, how long are we looking at? Well, we're going to be wor look, working at the first part of that, which is the looking at the land cover data and developing our canopy cover targets first. And so that I, I imagine we'll be doing over the next six months or so. and. Um, and then the tree planting prioritization comes after that. So um, I would say end of next year or beginning okay. of the year after, yeah. Okay, that's very helpful. And then you mentioned we're reassessing every five years about, so does that mean we're getting LIDAR data uh, every every five years essentially, will there'll be uh, that data coming in? Yeah, we'll, we'll basically do this same project again in five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's helpful. Um, our, in your opinion, and you may not know this, but just because we have this baseline data, but are, are we losing tree canopy or are we gaining tree canopy in Ottawa? What, 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 what's the trend line? You know, we, I can't speak to the entire city. Um, and of course, uh, um, you, you're probably aware of that in the information we released around our tree bylaw study yes. that we um, did look at a couple of neighborhoods and the and the level using a totally different technique looking at tree loss there and we did see that over the between 2008 and 2017 um, w there was tree loss in certain neighborhoods in our urban neighborhoods around the city um, and so we are seeing that there, but as a full city perspective, I can't, I can't, we don't have the data to, to say that. Okay, so we'll, I, I will see that in the next baseline data that comes forward. We've got this baseline now, we'll, we'll see future data updates. Um, that's good to know. And then the two wards, obviously, I'm sure people will be interested in which ones, or which neighborhoods, I guess, you looked at. Um, I don't know if you can say that or not, but that would be helpful. Um, so if you can, please do it in a second. <laughs> um, with regard to, um, the uh, uh, tree canopy associated with zoning. That is a major issue, right? We're, we're seeing more, we have residential neighborhoods, which there's a lot of effect for those individual homeowners or people that, that live in that area that 
can decide whether or not we've got those trees there or not. So residential, I think the, the tree canopy cover was about 25%. But in our institutional areas, it's very, very low. And so zoning plays a factor in all of this. How much are you working with, um, you know, within PIED, within the department, to talk about uh, changes to zoning? I, I'm sure it, it's coming in the bylaw review as well. I'm sure there'll be changes there. Uh, but how, you know, what's your process there to work with uh, our, our, uh, our folks in PIED around zoning um, to make sure we're not losing as many trees as we've been losing now when a developer puts up a, a housing? Well, through the tree bylaw review, as as you, you know, the whole issue of infill and tree loss is the main issue that we've been focusing on. And so I've been working very closely with our zoning group on um, developing possible solutions to how we can reflect this tree or solve this tree problem through zoning. So we do have um, a couple of ideas and we'll be bringing that forward with the tree bylaw review. We have to still flesh things Which out. Which comes pretty soon, right? That's coming back yes. uh, Okay, in the next few months, is it? Yes, we expect that we'll be here in December. In December, that. okay, that's, mm -hmm. that's great to hear. And then the last question I have is around um, climate change and, and capturing CO2s. Trees are obviously very good at this, and so mm -hmm. the more trees you have, the, the more uh, capturing of, of uh, CO2 occurs. And so uh, are you working with folks like uh, Andrea Flowers and that team, um, given that we are coming up with that I think is also coming in December, a whole bunch of initiatives that we're hoping will, will help uh, you know, uh, produce results on the climate emergency that we passed around this table and, and at council table. Um, one of the areas is, is certainly around trees. Is that something you're working on there and looking at it through a, through a climate uh, lens? Uh, absolutely. We've been working with um, with Andrea's group on some green infrastructure aspects of things and then also on the asset management aspect and so how we can bring our tree canopy asset into asset management as well. And so those are just some of the few things but we will, we sit literally next to them and work and work quite closely with them on things. So I don't have any big examples right now but those are the things we've been talking about. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? No? Thanks for your time today. Appreciate it. Thanks. So on that item, is that to receive the presentation? Thanks. So that's it for the agenda. Notices of motion? None. Inquiries? None. Other business? None. Adjournment? Carried. Carried. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, November 19th, and by the sounds of it, the December meeting is going to be somewhat long, so I guess I'll see if I can bump some stuff up into November. <laughs> Thanks.